Hello and welcome to the York Creators Podcast. My name is Ben Porter and each week you can join me as I chat to someone from York's creative community. This week's guest is Matt Richards. Matt is a director and executive producer for Air TV, a television production company based at Church Fenton. The company makes several emergency shows such as Helicopter ER with the Yorkshire Air Ambulance and 999 Rescue Squad with a specialist paramedic unit in Leeds. They also make the classic car auction series Bangers and Cash and several other documentaries. Matt has previously worked for the BBC. He's a qualified Air Ambulance Technical Crew Member and is one of Air TV's licensed drone operators. In this episode, we follow Matt's journey through the TV industry, discussing how he's used his work to follow his passions. We chat about the tremendous value he's seen from investing in personal relationships, about learning to manage risk through outdoor adventure activities, and Matt tells us why there's no better place to make television than Yorkshire. Matt, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. So you're a director and executive producer at Air TV, and you guys make a whole range of different shows, um, but quite a few of them surround people getting rescued from dangerous situations. Why do you think audiences are so drawn to these kind of programs? It's kind of strange because audiences kind of go through waves with these kind of things. And at the moment, there are loads of programs like ours. So we make Helicopter ER with the Yorkshire Air Ambulance. Uh, we used to do Helicopter Heroes, which is a long-running BBC daytime show with them. So we've been working with them for 11 or 12 years now. Uh, we also do 999 Rescue Squad with the specialist paramedics in uh, the centre of Leeds, the hazardous area response team. But like I say, there are loads of others, you know, 999, what's your emergency and um, you know, Code Red and all sorts of others on at the moment. And I think people who do more normal jobs, you know, if you're sitting in an office or you're selling insurance or you know, driving a bus or stacking shelves in a supermarket or whatever it is, I think people are just sort of fascinated by those kind of jobs, whether it's police or ambulance or other sort of reactive jobs where things are literally unpredictable minute by minute. Um, and that never goes away, really. And medical emergency shows particularly just have kind of everything that storytelling needs really it's genuine human stories uh relationships and families and uh, you know people in really difficult situations but uh quite often due to the great work that the paramedics and the doctors and uh, you know the pilots and everyone else are doing on the helicopter programs a great resolution at the end so from a storytelling point of view it, it kind of all, always sort of works really and and people are just fascinated by that kind of interesting life that constantly gives you those kind of stories uh, that translate quite well to television. Yeah, it's an interesting thing about human nature in that it's obviously not nice to feel in danger, but we're so fascinated by watching it. Yeah, I, I think, you know, clearly there is that factor when people are watching programmes like this in a kind of, oh, thank God that's not me, you know. Mm. Um, but equally, people want to see, a, you know, a positive resolution at the end. So a very important part of our programme on uh, Helicopter ER is going back revisiting the patients and, you know, seeing how they have got the life back on track and, you know, they're, they're recovering and, they're, you know, they're back to work or they're back riding the horse or riding a motorbike or whatever it was that, that happened to them. Um, and so having that kind of resolution at the end and, you know, 24 hours in A&E and all the other programmes uh, do that as well. People kind of want to come away from these programmes, you know, not feeling all doom and gloom, but actually uplifted, you know, pride in the NHS and everyone who's working in medical healthcare in the UK and sort of enthused by human human nature and people helping each other, really. I think that's yeah. what's behind it all. So what's it like making these programmes? Because obviously they're quite high-pressure environments. Um, you've got to make sure you obviously don't get in the way of the people doing their jobs. There's a lot to kind of take into account, isn't there? Yeah, they, they are difficult shows to make. Um, like I say, our relationship with the air ambulance goes back sort of 12 years now. And what all of our team know is that we've got to be human beings first and programme makers second. And so... The absolute bottom line is we don't get in the way, we don't impact on the story at all, and the patient comes first. And so all of the people who uh, appear on our programme, uh, they're consented ideally twice, so once at the point just for the point of filming, uh, but everyone's kind of visited in person, we go through exactly what it is, they often see the footage, so that by the time the show's on, which can be, it can be a few months before we go for that consent, it can be several years depending on uh, the progress, but we keep in touch with all of the patients and that's really important. Um, and it's a, a very multi-skilled job, particularly on the helicopter show, because there's only space for one person in the aircraft. So that person is the camera person, the sound recordist, the producer, you know, got to look after the consents on scene, the uh, 
storytelling and actually film the thing as well as well as running the GoPro cameras which are in the aircraft and on the paramedics so there's a lot going on so it's, it's, a, it's a busy job and then obviously there's all of our back-end team our great consenting team uh, and looking after the compliance and the legal aspects and chasing the court cases and all of that sort of stuff so it's I, th- I think as TV programs go, these kind of medical shows are about as complicated as they get and constantly throw up interesting sort of ethical questions and legal and compliance questions and all of those sort of things that we, we sort of work through to make sure that, you know, we're not upsetting people, but we're putting out a, an engaging show that's reflecting the great work the NHS is doing. Yeah. So how did you get started in the industry? Did you always want to work in TV? Uh, I did, yeah. I always wanted to be a news reporter. And I did broadcast journalism at Leeds University. And then uh, as part of that, there was a work placement. uh, And I went to the BBC uh, Regional Features Programme and ended up working for Ian, who's one of the directors that we're with now. There's three of us who run the company now. And so it was that work experience uh, working for his team that's kind of led to where we are. But in the interim, uh, I was a news reporter for the regional news. So I was based uh, in Hull, working for Look North for eight or nine years which was a fantastic grounding in TV production because every day you're going out and just making a short film, basically, whether it's, you know, doing a court case or, you know, features program, features items that you get on the kind of regional programs. And and so you just meet so many people from different walks of life. You get used to trying to get the best out of them, how to tell a story in a sort of uh, shortish way. And then when I was doing that, I was always sort of wanting to do longer form stuff. Uh, and then the opportunity came to work on the Helicopter Heroes program, as it was back then. Uh, went across to do that. In the interim, I kind of worked in um, sort of uh, for BBC features and documentaries. Worked out of Bristol and uh, Cardiff for a bit and out of Salford on the one show. Uh, and then the opportunity arose to leave the BBC and basically do a very similar helicopter show outside in the commercial world. And from that, we've kind of tried to grow the business in other directions as well. Mm-hmm. So I'll ask you more about that in a minute. But um, jumping back a bit further, what were some of your favourite programmes as a kid? I used to love, um, and you can always date people by what, how they describe Saturday morning telly, but for me it was the going live period. Um, uh, but it, it was always those live studio shows where you get that glimpse of what's going on behind the camera, where you sometimes see a cameraman. Or uh, Going back a little bit further, there's Challenge Annika, um, which is a sort of challenge renovation show. Uh, but the sound man Dave and the cameraman were kind of part of the characters, and I was just fascinated by that, and I thought, that looks so cool. Um, and I think it was those kind of things, just catching that kind of glimpse or when you just saw into a TV gallery and thought, God, they look at exciting places to be. Yeah, there is something fascinating about looking behind the curtain of what you're presented with, because I found that with music as well. It's sort of, you know, growing up, love listening to music. And then remember like the first time I saw like what a recording studio looked like, it's like, oh, that's where they make all this stuff. That's loads more fascinating than the end product. Obviously, you still love yeah. listening to music, but yeah, kind of looking behind the curtain, or it's like if you get to go to the theatre and actually you see all the backstage area, it's like, oh, this is where people are making stuff. And I think for creatives, it's sort of you see that and it sparks something inside you, doesn't it? I think so. And I think it goes back to why people watch our shows, that people are interested in a, in a world they don't know much about and that's, you know, perhaps seems more interesting than other people's day, day-to-day job. So whenever we've done the kind of little behind-the-scenes features about how we make the programmes, they're massively popular. And when we first started doing Helicopter ER, because all the paramedics wear body cameras, Sometimes it catches our camera operator actually in the shot and we think, oh, that's not very professional or filmic or cinematic or whatever and tries to edit it all out. And we've sort of stopped doing that now because I think people understand that to film this programme, clearly someone is there with a camera filming it. And actually, if you see them occasionally, it's authentic. It it is what it is. So, yeah, we don't go out of our way to, to hide the process of making the show anymore because I think people understand that's what it is and people are kind of interested in how the whole thing works. Mm. So tell me about the journey from BBC to Air TV then. Was that kind of a scary transition period or did it feel quite natural and like a next step? Or? Uh, it was a scary period. I absolutely loved working at the BBC. It's such a great, you know, it's one of the world's greatest brands. You know, you travel around the world and so you work for the BBC. And, you know, at this point I was a news reporter on a local programme in, in Hull. But people, wow, the BBC, you know, it's got such a great reputation. And so to kind of leave that behind and then just be a small independent production company based somewhere between Leeds and York, you kind of lose that badge. Um, but it's... It's really exciting on the outside because we can pick the projects we want to do. We're always led by the passion of of, uh, our guys and our team, really, and and what they're interested in. And that's the way to make the best programmes. I think if you're constantly going for, you know, what might sell well or what's the trend at the moment, then 
I don't think you're ever going to make the best content. So we do stuff that we're genuinely interested in and passionate about. And I think hopefully that comes across on the telly. And so, yeah, whenever we're pitching ideas, it's just stuff we'd like to make. <laughs> so, and, and that's the beauty of the job, really. And it's we're so lucky to be able to do this, that you can kind of pick the direction that you want the company and the programs and the team to kind of to kind of go in. And all of our team buy into that and are pitching ideas they're passionate about as well. Yeah. So when was that that you made the transition? So that was about four or five years ago. So Ian and Andy, the other two directors, uh, they left uh, the BBC just before me. Um, and then as soon as they got their helicopter ER commission for a, um, a commercial channel for UK TV, uh, they asked me to kind of join them and, and sort of look after that aspect for them. So there, there were a few kind of sleepless nights and trips to the pub to discuss it with various yeah. people think do we go for it but yeah once you're out I think and this is a, true of every, everyone who's left the big organizations I think to go um, independent no one ever looks back and thinks oh, I wish I'd stayed there because the opportunities are you know what you make of them really yeah and it must be like with any startup at that beginning period you're trying to find people you've got to work out budgets you've got so many things to take into account yeah it, it's difficult I mean we're so lucky we've managed to land such an amazing team of people and uh, we work slightly differently to a lot of indies who would tend to hire people in the freelance community on fairly short contracts for specific projects we tend to have a smaller team for longer periods uh, so our programs tend to get commissioned in bulk so we're making 30 episodes of helicopter ER at the moment we just delivered 10 of 999 rescue squad and the, the kind of big multiples and spread over quite a long period of time and because of the nature of the shows, we, we're not, we've not got massive crews of people. So we tend to have fewer people for a longer period. And I think as part of that, the, the people in our team are more buy-in to the company and are keen to see it progress as well and pitch those ideas. Um, so, yeah, recruitment is one of the hardest things because, you know, you're spending a lot of money on, on your team and you, you've got to make sure you've got the right people. And, you know, sometimes things don't work out for whatever reason people move on to other things but you know on the whole we've been really fortunate to end up with some some great people in our team where we know that whatever we're producing is going to be top notch and uh, you know if the broadcasters like it then they commission some more and clearly that works yeah so other than people what are some of the investments either in time or resources that either yourself or ATV have um, invested in which you think have helped get you to where you are it's I guess it's investing in relationships is the key thing so you know we've we've got buildings we've got a nice um, sort of slightly unusual office because we're based at the Church Fenton Airfield so a former Second World War air base we're alongside along one of the uh, hangars in there with a load of sort of private jets and stuff parked one side a uh, airfield on the other but it's a really interesting place because they're um, filming period dramas in one of the hangars and so there's some creative industries uh, there as well but the key investment is always in people and whether that's people within our own team or the contributors we're dealing with because such with the relationship with the ambulance service you know we've got two programs that rely on that relationship and if we stuff that up or you know aren't people that they want to deal with then you know they're totally within their rights to say actually we've had enough of this we'll work with someone else so you know making sure that all of the paramedics the doctors you know the management of uh, those nhs teams and the charity at the air ambulance but then also with the other relationships with the people we're working with as well outside the medical world yeah we make a classic car program bangers and cash up in north yorkshire and you know the relationship with these guys is absolutely key to it so uh, that's where you've got to spend all of your time. You, and it goes back to what we were saying before. It's it's about being a human being, a nice person first, and worrying about business or television or ratings or anything else. It's yeah. further down the pile. So you've got two roles, director and executive producer. Um, for someone who perhaps has no idea about this industry, can you explain what those two roles are? <laughs> it, it's To be honest, I'm not totally sure either. It's <laughs> literally a bit of everything. And... I think how our company works is everyone sort of does a bit of everything and just pitches in, uh, whether that's someone who's just joined us as an edit assistant or whether, you know, that's me you know, or Andy um, at the other end. Um, I, I guess the director of the company side is looking after, make, you know, making sure it's stable and, um, you know, the money's coming in to be able to pay people and... We're, you know, we're looking after health and safety and COVID restrictions at the moment and all of that sort of stuff. Uh, whereas executive producers more to do with the content of the programmes and just making sure that they're compliant and, you know, interesting stories and working on uh, development and getting recommissions and that sort of thing. Um, but the fun bit of television is still going out there meeting people and filming people. So I'm 
very reluctant to, to give that up. So, you know, tomorrow I'm going to film on a Saturday morning down in Rotherham uh, with some magnet fishers, <laughs> fish, fishing, fishing team, <laughs> nice. um, which is something I've you know never done before. But, you know, the potential we might do some work with them. Um, we're doing a new series, a property renovation series. And, you know, I'm going out meeting those people and filming on site with them as well. So uh, we all kind of do a bit of everything. So titles are a strange thing in television. And a, a lot of people get hung up about, you know, grades and titles and what each job means. Uh, but I think there's an increasing number of companies like ours where as long as you get the right people with the right attitude, um, the role kind of fits their skill set and we get the most out of them and they get the most out of being able to develop in whichever direction they want to as well. Yeah. So if you were hiring someone to take your job, what would be some of the, the key sort of uh, characteristics and skills you'd be looking for? Right, that's a question. Um, I, I guess it's empathy, really. I think it's being able to understand where other people are coming from, whether that's negotiating a, a budget for a, a new commission or whether that's dealing with a, a patient's family. Uh, who, you know, we've got footage uh, that we've dealt with. So it, it's kind of just trying to understand what, where people are coming from, what they're wanting, and being able to manage priorities is the other thing, I think. I think a key part of my role is managing risk, whether that's, you know, actual safety risk in terms of risk assessments, people falling off building sites or, you know having accidents on the helicopter base uh, or, you know, the risk to the company of what happens if we don't do this or what happens if we do do that. So it, it's sort of, yeah, I think empathy and being a people person first, being able to communicate relatively successfully, um, but also just being able to multitask quite well and sort of balance several things at the same time and prior, prioritizing stuff as well. I think that's that's the key bit. But, you know, none of it's particularly complicated. You know, television is a, a great kind of communal thing. No one's one single person is never the key to a show. It's about building and managing a team so that everyone can bring their best to it. Uh, and then hopefully that appears on the screen. People watch it. The viewing figures are successful. Advertisers want to advertise next to it. And therefore the broadcasters say, well, that's, that's worth our investment again. Let's have a bit more of that. So that's kind of the process we go through. So uh, yeah, multi-skilling, empathy, and uh, sort of, yeah, balancing priorities really mm. it sounds like you also need to be fairly open-minded because if you're going into lots of different industries and seeing how people work and telling that story if you go in with a preconceived idea you're only going to make a very specific program compared to if you just sort of if you try and unearth the stories as they go yeah exactly i think again that's that balance between being a sort of niche producer that specializes in a certain area or have, having a wider sort of breadth and you know, our first three shows were all kind of medical emergency shows. So clearly we had that risk of, oh, they're the guys in Yorkshire who make the blue light emergency shows. And we wanted to diversify away from that. Um, we still like those shows and they're always, um, you know, still very much a core part of what we do. Um, but I think, you know, we, we need to get wider. So we've moved into, um, you yeah, know, the classic car bangs and cash program, which is a, a really nice uh, obdoc program with a, a great family run business up in uh, Thornton Ladale near Pickering and then from that we did a, um, a war plane restoration series because we had that relationship with the yesterday channel and now we're looking at a property series and uh, when I was chatting to the commissioning editor about you know why we ended up going in this direction I think the truth is uh, I love grand designs as a program always wanted to work on it never did <laughs> so we thought well why don't we do our own version of it really um, and I'm sort of fascinated by home builds and renovations and things myself um, and within our team some of, some of the others are, are very keen on that as well and so it's it's totally a passion project and I think if you follow those you're always going to make good telly I think yeah it's such a wonderful industry for things like that because it really does open doors if there's anything you're interested in like when I got started I sort of I'd never picked up a camera before, but I just started emailing people saying, I'm, I'm going to make documentaries about creative people. And suddenly people wanted to talk to me and tell me all about their stories and how they worked and things like that. And then when I was, um, I had my company, Hewitt and Walker, we made marketing films, but even then like we'd be sent up to the top of Scotland to film fishermen. And then we'd be over in Norway filming Vikings. And like, there's so many different things and like, Every day can be completely different if you want it to, or you can just focus on a super niche and get really like invested in that, and it's so exciting. It is, and it's it's about being genuinely interested in lots of different people, and I think I certainly learned that from my news reporting days, in that if you're sent to do a two-minute Look North feature about a bloke who collects 
model railway stuff, then I think there are people who would go to that really cynically and sort of take the mick a little bit. But I just think I'm fascinated by people's passions, whatever they are. And it might be something I know absolutely nothing about, but people's enthusiasm for it is infectious. And I think having the outlook on life that you can sort of tap into that and, and share in their enthusiasm for stuff is a really useful skill um, in program making. But I think in sort of building teams and anything else, management, leadership, all that sort of stuff as well. I think it's, yeah, it's, it's sharing in other people's passion for stuff and understanding where they're coming from. Yeah. So outside of work, you were rock climbing and mountain instructor for a while. Do you want to tell me a bit about that? Yeah. So uh, kind of as a teenager, um, scouting and venture scouting, which you now explorer scouting was a key part of my life uh, down in Sheffield. And, you know, he used to go on climbing trips around Europe and all of that sort of stuff. And yeah, I ended up being a, a rock climbing instructor and a, a sort of mountain leader. Um, and always still, you know, that's how I would love to spend my weekends, you know, going away, camping in the Lake Districts. Uh, I've got a um, small Labrador now who's uh, coming up to being three years old, Barney. So yeah, we go out walking with him on the, on the mountains and things. So that's, it's a place I really feel comfortable in and really enjoy. And uh, for the last few years with a, a couple of other mates, we've run an outdoor adventure competition for young people uh, called the Apex Challenge, where we have, it's built up now, so sort of 400 young people take part in that every year. Oh. We've had to cancel it this year for obvious reasons. Um, but it's, again, it's kind of, I know the buzz of outdoor adventure of, you know, abseiling for the first time or, uh, you know, getting lost, but the fun of getting lost and that kind of adrenaline rush of not quite knowing where you are or what's going on. And so being able to share that um, with other people from other scout and guide groups elsewhere, I think you know, it's, a, it's a really rewarding thing. And again, we've built up a really sort of passionate team of volunteers who, who help to run that. And, you know, it's, it's, it's hard work, but great fun. Yeah. It's really important for the kids to have these opportunities as well. I remember my childhood, like some of the best memories were just kind of going out exploring places and adventuring and climbing rocks and stuff like that. And I don't want to be all sort of doom and gloom like this younger generation doesn't do that. But from my own limited experience with my younger brother, they don't go out anywhere near as much as I did. I'm sure every generation says that, but you know, it does seem there is a bit of bit more fear now um, compared to there was perhaps maybe 20 years ago. I think there is. I think clearly there's lots of organisations in you know in education they totally value this learning outside the classroom kind of kind of thing. But <laughs> to be honest, actually, uh, it's sort of reassuring in a way on the helicopter program, for example, that we still get called to people, you know, kids falling off rim and rocks and hurting their ankles and stuff you know no one ever wants to see anyone getting seriously hurt but actually you know still seeing kids falling off rope swings in the woods and you know hurting, hurting their legs or breaking their arm and that sort of stuff it's kind of reassuring that people need that adventure because it, without that they don't learn how to manage risk and I think that's more dangerous going forward so actually you know I, I was always in and out of A&E with broken arms and legs and all, all the rest of it <laughs> And uh, it, it's, it's the way to sort of learn, you know, you can push yourself in adventure and you, you can try doing it and, and then you sort of know the limit. And I think if you're always protected from risk, it's very hard for people to then understand where the actual risk is rather than just that kind of perceived risk. Yeah. And that's the thing with the Apex Challenge events, that it's, it's about trying to make it seem as dramatic and you know, the perceived risk as high as it possibly can for a 14, 15 year old taking part in it, while obviously keeping the, the actual risk very low which, you know, things like tough mudder events, those kind of things do, where they've got these massive obstacles, you're running through fire and getting electrocuted. Whereas actually, everyone knows the real risk is really low, but you build up the drama to make it feel like it's a really exciting adrenaline kind of thing to do. And actually, managing that risk is a similar sort of thing to what we do at work as well, in a, yeah. in a slightly different way. Yeah, I was about to say, it's, it's coming back to what we were talking about at the beginning, it's sort of that build and release of tension and storytelling and drama and putting yourself in slightly dangerous situations to sort of remember that it's important to be alive and not just sit there and do nothing. Yeah, exactly. And whether that's, you know, a blue light emergency show or it's someone uh, at a car auction with a car they've had for 20 years, seeing the auction price go up and wondering what price they're going to get to it. You know, those kind of human dramas are, are sort of similar. Because like you say, it's that same kind of emotional release that people can relate to and therefore viewers kind of engage with. And it's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting process. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you find being based sort of around here? Because you're between York and Leeds, aren't you? Um, why this this area? So the honest answer is it's this area because that's where we're all based. But there's no better place to make television than Yorkshire, I don't think. It's, if we were making our 
helicopter program anywhere else you just wouldn't get the variety of landscapes and incidents because one minute you're on you're on one of the busiest motorways in the country or you know the big industrial centers uh, where we see kind of industrial accidents occasionally but then you've got the north york moors you've got uh, the yorkshire dales you're out on the coast uh, down the humber uh, so the scenery is a, a key character in our programs uh, and the yorkshire people are great value for t- for television because they say it how it is you know i think people who are more reserved in i don't know the home counties or something are less likely to make engaging television than what we get you know on uh, bangs and cash or you know some of our other shows as well so um i think it's a great place to make television it's where we're all based there's certainly no need uh to go and you know run a production company in london uh, the trend is clearly out of london to places like this and it you know it makes business sense your overheads are a lot lower you're paying a lot less for uh, you know office space in church fenton than you would be for an edit in soho um but it's it's more fun it's a nicer place to live and work and the people are the people are better so you know we're very proud to be based in yorkshire make programs here and, and shout about it as loud as we can so if someone was wanting to get into the industry what would your advice be to them i, th- I think there's all sorts of ways in and You know, the conventional wisdom is, you know, go and do a film and TV production course and then potentially go and do a master's and then approach a production company. And I think, you know, some of our most successful recent hires have been people with completely different backgrounds. You know, we've got an assistant producer who used to be a teaching assistant. We've got uh, someone who joined us having done an environmental science degree. Um, But I think it's a very difficult time at the moment because we were just discussing our kind of work experience program and, you know, we used to have people come into the office for a couple of weeks or go out with our research team when they're going to visit and consent patients and interview them. And of course, we can't do any of that um, at the moment. So it's it's really difficult. But I would say uh, whatever line they're looking to go in is follow the passion because when we get a CV that's not just oh, I've done this media degree and therefore I want to work in television, it's absolutely nail down on, on what it is that you like about what we do um, or whatever other company. So, you know, when people tell us their dad's always really been into classic cars and they've just bought their first one and, they, you know, they're changing the head gasket. I know nothing about cars. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was watching episode three of this latest series of Bangers and Cash and I was really interested in how you did that. That's a much better way to start a conversation with someone than your standard here's my cv i really want to get into television so i'd say you know be persistent send lots of emails to people but every time you send an email make it specific to that company where you know whether that's us or any of the other great companies in this part of the world there's nothing worse than a copy and paste sort of like you can spot from a mile off so i'm mm, sorry it i'm is. not going to reply to that one <laughs> it is. and you know it's unfortunate when you get those where they have tried to change it um, and they've said and that's why we'd really like to work at this production company hang on that's not us that's <laughs> yeah oh, really like, i really love that program oh we don't make that um, but then you know we're guilty of the same thing you know we send uh, pitches to lots of uh, broadcasters and of course we're doing the same thing changing the email saying and that's why we really want to work with this broadcaster and so you've got to check check and double check that you don't make a fool of yourself when you when you send that email but but at least it's showing that people are sort of you know attempting to tailor their approach to uh, wherever they're approaching at the time yeah. yeah so if people want to find out more about air tv where do they go uh, so our website, airtv.co.uk, uh, we're on Twitter at airtv underscore UK. Um, but I think the best way to learn about what we do is to, to watch the shows. Um, at the moment, 999 Rescue Squad is on uh, the W channel on a Tuesday night at 10. Uh, Bangs and Cash is on the Yesterday channel and also on uh, uh, UK TV Play. Uh, Helicopter ER is just having a little break at the moment, but we'll be back with some Christmas episodes in December. Uh, and then hopefully some uh, some new stuff coming in coming in next year as well. Great. Well, that seems like a perfect place to end. <laughs> Thanks very much. Great Thank to you. chat to you. Bye bye.